to begin the session by introducing our, our two speakers. The New American Colleges were founded by a common interest in developing new and innovative approaches to undergraduate and graduate education. And as traditional liberal arts colleges, they began to evolve into a new type of liberal arts institution. Our speakers today, John Gardner and Betsy Barefoot, are also innovators who have been in the forefront of revolutionizing the undergraduate education experience. Their focus initially was on how experiences during the first critical year of college could more effectively support the transition from high school um, to, to college, and also student learning and to some extent retention, although that was, I guess, a, a byproduct in some ways. Um, last January, NAC and you presented uh, the Boyer Award to John and Betsy for their lifetime commitment to studying and improving the ways in which we educate undergraduate students. John is president of the John Gardner Institute for Excellence in Undergraduate Education that he and Betsy, who is vice president, founded in 1999. The Institute plays a unique leadership role in higher education by supporting colleges and universities as they pursue the attainment of excellence in undergraduate education. By focusing its, experience, its expertise on the development of assessment-based action plans with measurable outcomes, the Institute fosters institutional change by enhancing accountability, coordination, and the delivery of efforts associated with student learning um, and, su and success and retention during the undergraduate um, experience. While the Institute undertakes activities to strengthen all of undergraduate education, it places particular emphasis on the special efforts to improve the success of beginning college students at whatever stage they're beginning th their college. Some of us can remember the early days, I know I can, um, the early days of the work of John and Betsy as our campus is introduced for the first year seminars and other activities to improve the first year experience for students. And I have to say for me that was one of the most rewarding experiences in my teaching when we began doing that kind of work at the University of, of Redlands. John and Betsy have had a profound and a continuing impact on our efforts to achieve excellence in our work with, with students. We are um, very honored to have these two innovative and accomplished educators with us today to share their insi the insights that they have gained from many years of study and research. And I asked John this morning how many campuses he had actually visited. And I think he said it was 600 or so over the time that they've been working with campuses. So they have a wealth of experience to share with us. So let's welcome John Gardner and Betsy Barefoot. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for my most recent introduction at Westminster College. I, I uh, am accomplishing something that uh, rarely happens for me. I've been invited back a second time. And uh, I, it was about 15 years ago when I was here, and I've enjoyed uh, getting some vignettes about how things are different and how they're the same. And it's given me an opportunity to, of course, have a reunion with the, uh, the soon to be departing president. Uh, Michael is one of four presidents here, one who just introduced herself, uh, whose uh, early part of their career uh, represented a significant investment in first year work. And I'm referring to Richard Garassi of Wagner College and Mark Heckler of Valparaiso and um, uh, Michael, of course, and you, Nancy. And uh, all of you, I think, were able to accomplish more for uh, particularly several or more institutions because you, you stayed and, and uh, you really made a difference. I never had a real job 
So I haven't done what those uh, lady and gentlemen did. But I uh, feel a great sense of intrinsic satisfaction with the work that I have been able to do with, we should uh, disclose, with my wife, Betsy Barefoot. We have the privilege of having our marriage legally recognized. And um, we're able to do this work together. And um, uh, we have been doing uh, work together since uh, we met in 1988. And we met at the University of South Carolina, which is the original USC, chartered in 1801. Um, this, uh, <clears throat> I'm in the West, I, I have to say that. Uh, we do want to thank uh, all of our hosts from the college here for their hospitality and their preparation of us in advance. And we're honored to join you. Uh, we're especially honored that we have been named in anything in reference to uh, Ernest Boyer. Uh, we knew Ernie quite well. As a matter of fact, I have a picture in my office of me standing at a podium introducing Ernie Boyer and Ernie looking quite bored with the whole thing. And uh, um, I was with him a number of times when he spoke and he, he always would have a four by six card, which I'm sure he, he wrote on the, last flight, on the leg of the flight into wherever he was going. It just emerged so spontaneously and naturally from him. And the last time I was with him in any kind of literal way was at his funeral at the Princeton Chapel in 1995. And uh, he's left an enormous void, which I'm sorry to say uh, no one in American higher education seems to have arisen to, to fill. Uh, so this uh, uh, way that uh, this association has of honoring his memory and his legacy, uh, we think is very important. And we are very touched by this honor. And we're going to do our best to live up to it. We know the, the first recipients, uh, Lena and Sandy Aston, who I understand were with you last year. And uh, we have a lot in common with the Astons. Um, you know, we were a couple and we spent our whole careers, much of our whole careers, much of our careers working at one institution. And we're still focused on um, a lot of those issues. Uh, when we were young, somebody said, uh, stay focused. So that's what we've done. Um, our, our work especially has been about the uh, first year, but it has also been about uh, a number of other transitions. And I just want to make a couple of overview uh, comments about those. Betsy's going, I'm going to talk more about the first year transition. And Betsy's going to uh, uh, give you some um, information from a national study she completed over a year ago uh, with data on some of these other transitions. Uh, I want to say, at the, to the extent that I can summarize everything, anything very briefly and succinctly, I want to say that most fundamentally, the first year is about the foundation. It's about intentionally creating the foundation for whatever you want to have happen to students. If you do that well, um, the probability of everything else goes well and going well is greatly increased. The sophomore year, um, I'm a co-author of a, a three, actually three author uh, volume published in 2009 called Helping Sophomores Achieve from Josie Bass. And I can reduce that 300-page um, work to uh, one phrase. The key developmental issue for second year students is about developing purpose. Developing purpose. Uh, many of them are not ready to focus on that in the first year, but if they don't focus it on the second year, uh, they're going to have a, uh, and if they don't resolve some elements of that in the second year, they are going to have a distinctly different experience. So much of our work in the second year focuses on purpose. Um, the combination of the third and fourth year we think of as comprising the middle years. The best thing I've seen written uh, about increasing focus and effectiveness with the middle years was a plan for the regional accreditor, the Southern Association, a plan written by the University of Texas, El Paso of all places, on uh, achieving greater student success in the middle years, where uh, it's amazing. We find some students drop out of college as late as the last 15 hours. So you're not there until you're there. Uh, in the senior year, the subtitle of my uh, 1998 book on the senior year experience, I'm about to do a second edition of that or have one published, was entitled uh, Reflection, Integration, and Closure. Uh, academically, personally, developmentally, we think those are the three most important challenges uh, of the senior year. We would add to this work uh, another key uh, focus, and that is on the transfer students who are revolutionizing our campuses. Uh, I told uh, the presidents that Betsy and I met with this morning that 62%, according to the federal government, 62% of the currently enrolled baccalaureate degree seeking students have transcripts from more than one institution. They are the norm. 
the student who comes to one of your institutions and who stays there four or five years, doesn't go anywhere else, doesn't earn any credit anywhere else, they are the exception. And uh, so th these people are forcing us to do a tremendous amount of rethinking about how we organize American higher education. Part of Betsy's and my work is working with colleges and universities to help them create a plan for what they do with their transfer students. So uh, another way we look at the um, undergraduate continuum is in a succession of what we call critical junctures that are part of multiple transitions that students go through concurrently, simultaneously. And we think that's a powerful way to think about uh, the undergraduate um, experience. Now we, we entitled our, we were asked actually to entitle our remarks this morning and I quote, achieving educational and market distinctiveness in the first year of college. Okay. And beyond. Thank you, Betsy. That's right. And beyond. We added the and beyond. <laughs> um, she has influence on me in so many ways. Uh, um, I, I, we think that the, uh, the biggest challenge to achieving educational distinctiveness is the highly imitative nature of higher education. We all want to imitate each other. We all want to emulate particularly the higher status peers. And the highest status peers, of course, are not that, all that concerned about achieving educational distinctiveness. Um, I, I, the end result then is that um, it's, it's harder to stand out if you compete with each other to be like everybody else. And especially when the, the, the criteria for success are normed by the elite research and private universities, which um, you will never attain those cultures. So one of my concerns is that uh, your sector, the sector that produced me, and I am aware every day that what I do and the way I think and write and believe and value and make decisions was more influenced by my four years at a private liberal arts college than any other single experience I had. And I'm concerned that we in this sector are afraid to be too different. But I believe that to be viable in this economy that we're all spending a lot of time thinking about, particularly after the gloomy news we got from Mr. Bernanke yesterday, that if we don't focus more of an, on an intentional educational distinctiveness, uh, we are not going to be as viable as I believe we could, we could and should be. So what should we be doing? What should we be offering that might be distinctive? I said to the presidents this morning that uh, I regret that uh, what's happened is that, that the, uh, many of our consumers, I think, are coming to us for a meatless sandwich. They want two slices of bread, and the uh, bottom slice is what you do with them when they arrive. They're very concerned about that. They want to know about that. Families are very concerned about that. And they want to know about what you're going to do with them when they leave, okay? When families get a lot in very involved again, when everybody's anxiety goes up again. We think, of course, that what you do after the foundation and before the culmination is uh, equally uh, important. Now, uh, we're, we're currently in what you know is, uh, is being called the, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want you to leave thinking I'm trying to get you to uh, feel sorry for our colleagues in the public sector, but I would like to, colleague, I would like to comment on the public higher ed context because I think um, their misery offers you a significant window of opportunity. Most of the public universities did not exist in any significant form uh, during the, the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, most of them had their renaissance after the higher education uh, or the real development and expansion, particularly in the Northeast, uh, after the uh, uh, Higher Education Act of 1965, which made possible Title I and federal financial aid. And these institutions, therefore, have never had a Great Depression. But they are having it now. And this coming year, now that all the stimulus money is exhausted, and the, um, the effort by state legislatures uh, and the Congress to starve the beast are finally showing signs of great, great success. Uh, I assure you, I have never seen such pain uh, in the public sector. And I've worked, I, went, I worked through three recessions uh, at the University of South Carolina. So what's going on there? 
that I think uh, represents some contrast between that sector and you. Um, our colleagues in public higher education are outsourcing everything that, that moves uh, outside the faculty and in some case, cases even the faculty. Um, naturally, I'm very concerned about that. They are um, increasing uh, uh, their reliance on adjuncts. Uh, the research, by the way, is uh, building. The largest study of this kind was done in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that is a study measuring the probability of degree attainment as a function of how many credit hours the students take taught by adjuncts. The more credits you have taught by adjuncts, the less likely you are to graduate, okay? And of course, we are moving more and more of instruction to adjunct faculty. Larger classes, fewer classes, particularly required classes, which is going to significantly prolong time to degree completion rates. And time to degree completion rates are already overwhelmingly in your favor. That's an argument for, I think, any consumer to come to a private liberal arts college. The greater probability of graduating in less time. Um, greatly increased advisor to advisee ratios, less diversity. I don't know whether you're following what's happening to the characteristics in, this, in the nation's flagship research universities, but we are resegregating those institutions. It's absolutely stunning, okay? Uh, you, you, all of you have, uh, well, I can't say all of you because I don't, but I'm assuming that, that many of you have uh, greater degrees of uh, demographic diversity in your student body now than the majority of flagship state universities. Another factor that's happening, is operating, is that uh, many of the public institutions are in state systems, and they are being forced into articulation agreements with all the other public institutions in the states, particularly the community colleges, which means that the curricula are highly homogenized. You, you can't be really unique uh, in those kinds of structural models. Uh, it would be unthinkable for a public to develop a, uh, what I found at the liberal arts college where my son went, Elon University in North Carolina. I'm working on a book right now, a second volume of a wonderful uh, study about uh, innovation called Transforming a College. Some of you may know George Keller's 2004 book. And we're going back to look at to what extent they've been able to sustain innovation there. But at Elon, they have a 414 plan with a one course winter term can't do that in the public sector. Uh, the, the structures just don't permit that kind of uh, innovation. So I think that's uh, an advantage for you that is uh, fortuitous. Now, part of the context for our work, I feel compelled to say this, uh, not apologetically, and I've, I've been uh, saying this now. I try to every time I get an opportunity, because Betsy and I were reminded of what I'm about to say when we visited for the first time last January uh, the Republic of South Africa where we heard two words used that uh, we rarely ever hear in the United States now because they have become politically incorrect. And yet I believe they are still at the foundation of this work to improve student success. And those two words are social justice, social justice. That's what this work is fundamentally all about. It's about uh, taking uh, students for whom college was never designed and making college work for those students. And we have now uh, about 50 years experience doing this, and we know what to do uh, in order to do that. All we have to do is do it. Um, I was significantly influenced in my own case by a student riot at my institution, which was the catalyst in 1970 for the university under the leadership of its president then to create a new purpose for the university and therefore the first year and I offer this to you as a question which may or may not uh, guide some of your thinking. And that is, if we were to prevent riots, we, could we do that if we taught students to love the university? And we undertook what is now exactly a 40-year process, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary there, of a huge effort to involve every entering student in an effort to teach them to love the university. And we have had no riots for 40 years and greatly increased retention as a result of this uh, intervention. For me, that's still a viable question. What would you do to be more educationally distinctive if you had a set of foundational experiences that taught your students to love the university? Now, at the same period through about 30 years of this work, 
it was discovered that a number of what are now called high impact practices, if you launch them, you will um, increase your first to second year persistence rate. And this has dramatically changed much of the educational conversation about these initiatives. I think, unfortunately, from an educational focus to a business focus, a, a focus on retention and money and revenue as a result of these activities. I was sharing with the presidents this morning that our neighbors in the province of Ontario, higher education administrators, refer to students there as BIUs. BIU is their equivalent to an FTE. It means a basic income unit. Okay? And uh, um, what uh, I would urge you to do when you're thinking about the foundation uh, is, to, is to not forget the person that uh, comprises the BIU. Uh, now, in order to generate more BIUs, what colleges and universities did in their, uh, we understand why they did this, was that they launched a plethora of programs. And you have many of these programs. We, and I want to thank all of you that submitted information to us in advance about what you're doing. We were pleased to see those reports. And, uh, but our current work arises out of our concern that uh, programs are necessary, but they are not sufficient. They do not comprise the totality of an outstanding uh, beginning college experience. Uh, also, many of the, um, need something here? Okay. Um, the, the emphasis on programs, many of them were in response to urgent requests from administrators to do something about unacceptable attrition rates. And the development of many of these programs underutilized faculty and overemphasized the contributions of administrators and student affairs professionals who, thank goodness, were willing to come in and fill the breach. Um, our work has uh, taught us that if you want to have a profound, sustained change and improvement in the success of first-year students, the faculty must have significant ownership for that work. And everything that we do is uh, devoted to that outcome. And to, to have that kind of ownership in partnership, especially with our professional student affairs colleagues. What we have learned is that uh, the emphasis on programs has led to a proliferation of programs, the competition between programs for resources, people, space, a lack of coordination of programs, a lack of integration of programs, and therefore what we would describe as the lack of a comprehensive plan for the beginning college experience. So what we invite colleges to do now is to think about how would you create a comprehensive plan for what you want to be the foundation and also for the outline of these other transitional periods uh, during the undergraduate period. A plan then that must be executed. It must be institutionalized. Okay, um, our, our process for doing that is something called Foundations of Excellence. We've done this in 231 institutions and we've learned a lot from that process about how to improve student success. I want to share with you a few of our learnings. Uh, the first is, to it's a version of the answer to the famous question that was asked the bank robber, Willie Sutton, who was asked, why did, why did you rob banks? And you all know what his answer is, right? What was his answer? His answer was, that's where the money is, okay? To switch back then to a business metric, the money in your beginning college experience, we would argue, is in your five highest enrollment courses. It is in the places in the curriculum that are most heavily populated by your students. So we would argue if you want to improve your performance, you have to make the courses that are taught by the, excuse me, that are taken by the greatest number of students the absolutely most important things you teach. This is your signature instructional learning experience for your students. If you want to pick eight or ten, there's nothing magic in the number of five. But educational improvement, it has to be built on a focus. You have to decide where you're going to focus. So we would recommend, first of all, that you focus on your most highly enrolled courses. We would secondly recommend, in similar and partner fashion, that you focus on the courses in which you have the highest rates of Ds, Ws, Fs, Is. And, and, and you need to make sure that your whole community is aware of what those courses are. 
and how the whole institution is directed towards improving student success in those high failure rate courses. And there are some significant surprises in what those courses are. We've been collecting data on what are the highest failure rate courses. And Betsy, I seem to recall that the winner for that dubious distinction in our work is the discipline of economics. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, the, the so-called student success first year seminars, we're finding uh, surprisingly high failure rates in that course, above 20% DWFI rate grades. And we have to ask, if they're failing introduction to college, how can they be successful? Well, there's a big problem in those courses if they are flunking even that, okay? So those two areas of focus. Thirdly, we recommend that you do something called a policy audit, which simply means that you audit all the rules and regulations you have for new students and ask, when were these rules put in place? What was the rationale? Is the rationale still operative? Are the rules consistent? Are they in conflict with each other? And is the person who promulgated the rule even still living? Uh, because, uh, you know, our work is a focus on what, what do you control? What could you change? And one of the areas that you have greatest control over, particularly in private colleges, is you have control over your rules. You have some rules that come to you from the federal government, but most of your rules you have created. But you rarely ever go back and look at them again. We want you to look at how well your faculty and staff work together, communicate with each other, how integrated, coordinated your, your work is. We believe in the importance of setting high expectations early through early experiences, like the summer or common readings. We believe that what you uh, say on your website is extremely important. When we work with a college in uh, our process, we get every member of the, the study process to read every word of the website in terms of what it says to incoming students. And what I've learned from, one of the many things I've learned from Betsy is her three clicks test. If you've got to go more than three clicks to find out what's going to happen to me as an entering college student, you're being much too discreet. You're being much too subtle because that's what they really want to know about. You're missing an opportunity to raise expectations. We have learned about the importance of opening rituals and bonding, therefore orientation. We really believe in the importance of residential education, and that's one of your distinct advantages. I could give a whole uh, talk alone, you don't want this, that's not what I was invited to do, on why you shouldn't refer to that as housing. I think the whole concept of housing is one of the worst things that ever happened 50 years ago when we invented it, okay? We're not in the housing business, we're in the residential learning business. So how do you integrate, connect your residence halls to the curriculum? How do you integrate the work of faculty in residence halls? Um, talk a lot about that. Um, a guiding principle uh, for our findings about this work of improving the first year is that the finding that the greatest influence on what students do is the influence of other students. Okay, Huge body of research about that. So if you want to influence what beginning college students do, you do. You, the greatest source of influence is what you do with your best students, the students you most want them emulating. And how do you put them in positions of power and authority? Especially your honors programs. How integrated or segregated are those programs in every area, the curriculum, the residential involvement, co-curricular activities, et cetera. We're finding a great deal about the crucial importance of the role of the chief academic officer in this work. By the way, we've learned that at this institution, you have a chief academic officer here that one morning noted a student missing in one of his classes and invited his class to go to the residence hall and hold that class in that student's room while hopefully he had awoken. <laughs> is that the case, Mr. Provost? It is, okay? That's the level of engagement that we recommend in our provost, okay? And the other officer that we find makes the greatest difference in what happens in these transitions is the kind of chief undergraduate uh, advocate. There's got to be an advocate, and very commonly that's the associate uh, CAO of the institution. So one of the the key findings in institutions that are really moving the needle is they have an advocate, um, a, a conscience for this. Um, these are institutions that are able to come together and focus on what's in the best interest of the institution outside the academic department, but based on the academic departments, to be able to transcend that. Uh, th these are institutions that, yes, use high impact practices, but in a very integrated way. And they have come up with an answer to this question. And this question is, what do you want the common experiences to be? What do you want all of your students to experience besides parking and registration in your food service? Okay? What else do you believe in enough that you want them all to experience this? 
This is a way to differentiate. I passed out some brochures. I'm going to just I'm going to close with this. There, these are nine standards of excellence that we developed with a national team to define excellence in the first year. And we're arguing that institutions that are excellent in the first year, uh, they have a philosophy, a dis a, an explicit philosophy of the importance of the first year, what it's supposed to accomplish. They measure their performance by that. They have an organizational structure that assigns accountability for the first year that's coherent, it's understandable, people are in charge. They have learning goals for the first year in both the curriculum and the co-curriculum, and the uh, students are assessed on their attainment of those. All you have to do is be a sighted person and walk this campus, and you can see very visually the learning goals here. We're really delighted to see those. Another standard of excellence has to do with the role of the faculty and the extent of the ownership they engage for the first year. Another standard of excellence has to do with how well you know who your students are, why they're with you, what's happening to them, how informed are you about their characteristics, and how do you organize the college accordingly. Another standard is what do you know about the transitions that colleges, that students go through, and how you organize your institution to respond to those transitions. Another standard that's explained in your brochure has to do with diversity. You have the name college or university. How are you different from secondary school? What do you do to deserve that term? And roles and purposes has all about motivation. How do you explain to students what the roles and purposes of higher education are, and particularly your institution, and get them enthused about that? And finally, how do you fit the work on these foundational transitions into your overall improvement culture? What are the strategies at your institution that promote or inhibit uh, improvement? Uh, wish we had more time to talk about those. Okay, in conclusion, uh, the first transition that I've been talking about the first year, it matters. We would like to leave you with a question, or several questions about this, which you'll be discussing afterwards. And th the question is, where is your college or university? on a continuum of achieving excellence with respect to what you're doing for new students, what would you have to do to move the needle to increase your attainment of educational excellence? And do you have a plan to do so? And if you don't, do you need one? Do you want one? What would you have to do to develop one? And how would you connect such a plan as a foundation for what Betsy's going to talk to you about, which are some of these other transitions? I hope I've left you enough time. If I haven't, I apologize. Okay. <laughs>
But uh, we are also, in addition to the first year, very interested in the other years of the undergraduate experience. We're also concerned about developmental needs and interests of students in their second through fourth year of college and what we as educators can do to engage students at each of these levels. Um, in our years at the University of South Carolina, we saw the birth not only of University 101, but the birth of a sophomore and a senior seminar. And before we came out here, I got back on the University of South Carolina website. I thought, well, where are they today? Because John and I left USC in 1999. And I found that the University of South Carolina still offers University 201. And that's a course that focuses on essential components of research in a variety of different academic areas. They offer University 290, which is a series of interdisciplinary discussions in residential colleges. We have some residential colleges, believe it or not, at USC now. And so those courses are offered in that environment. And then University 401, uh, which is a capstone seminar that's really focused on preparing juniors and seniors for the transition to a career or to graduate school. So uh, interestingly, we pull the juniors into that University 401. We don't have a 301. Uh, so uh, maybe in a few years, somebody will, will get that idea as well. Now, as we think about students' developmental needs and interests, um, I think we tend to uh, consider traditional student populations that are more or less homogeneous. And we need to remember that that's not necessarily the case. A sophomore can be 19 or 39. Uh, a junior might be moving sort of lockstep through four undergraduate years or might be returning to college after an extended period of absence. Actually, that's my story. Uh, my needs and interests as a 32-year-old mother of three children who was back at Duke University, strangely enough, were different from those of my 20-year-old junior level peers. Uh, for one thing, I went to every class. And I sat, <laughs> I sat on the front row. And uh, my, my peers at that point, uh, those were the days, maybe for you too, but at Duke, the, the days of unlimited cuts. You had to show up for the first class, and you had to show up for the final examination. But if you could pass the final, that was OK. So, but that, that wasn't my experience. I was there all the time. So what this means is that our descriptions of these students are not totally neat and tidy. Now, perhaps they are more so for you. And certainly at Duke, I only knew one other adult student at Duke University when I went back uh, at age 32. So for Duke, a, a junior was 20 years old or, or in that approximate range. Uh, but just remember that there are still differences within any population. Now, when we look at what colleges and universities are doing for sophomores, juniors, and seniors through a variety of different types of transition courses and programs, I think it's reasonable to find, and we find, that institutions do predict what they think most students need, and they design these courses and programs accordingly. Now, I'm going to show you right now some data, some selected data from a national survey that the Gardner Institute administered about 18 months ago. And this was an assur a survey that included questions about the first year, but also included questions about what was going on in the three additional years of the undergraduate experience. Now, you're going to leave here, and you're going to uh, make your way over to the uh, Eccles Health, Wellness, and Athletic Center to the special events room. And in that room, we're going to seat you at round tables with other institutions. And we have brought along for you, for each institution, a copy of the survey report that we just produced, actually, a couple of months ago. And we, do, we have enough for one for each institution, okay? But if, if any of you would like uh, your own copy, we'd be happy to send you a paper copy. And in addition, this is available at no cost on our website. So you can always go to our website and, and download uh, this particular copy. So uh, let me 
show you where we're going to go with this. Um, the survey itself addressed seven areas of institutional programming. These areas support student transition and we believe enrich students' educational experiences. Now, you'll note that I have grayed out two initiatives that are limited to first-year students, uh, summer bridge programs and preterm orientation. But we have lots of data in this booklet that you'll be able to look at about those types of initiatives, where they're most likely to happen, how many students are participating, et cetera. But today, or this morning, I want to focus on the five initiatives that uh, really can be offered at any undergraduate level. Now, the survey questions began in each area with a central question that was sort of, do you have a particular initiative? And then went on to explore the characteristics of the initiative, its goals, its outcomes, and its perceived cost effectiveness. And that was a real interesting uh, line of questioning. And, and it was perceived cost effectiveness. So, you know, it's not, we didn't have the evidence that it was actual, but uh, what people think. Now, just a word of background on the, on the survey. We achieved a 38.4% response rate of chief academic officers or their surrogates. And now, this is a big deal, of course, but it's a response level that's it's pretty uh, common uh, in surveys, national surveys, uh, not only of chief academic officers, but of any other uh, institutional representative. The largest percentage of respondents was in the 1,001 to 5,000 category. And I know that may represent some of you. Some of you have more students than that, and we do have the data broken out uh, by various size categories. But this is where uh, we saw the largest uh, rate of response. Now, in our first question that we're going to address today uh, about academic and transition seminars, uh, this initial question was, do you have such a seminar at any level, first year, second year, third year, senior year. And of all the respondents, 87% or slightly over 87% said yes, we have one of these somewhere. Now, as you can see, the majority are in the first year. That's, that's not a surprise. Um, about a quarter in the sophomore year, uh, they jump up in percentages. Uh, in the senior year, but they really drop down in the sophomore and junior year, which again is, is no surprise. Now, do remember that here, in looking at this figure, 96.5% for first year, we have to multiply that by 87.1% to get the actual percentage. And the actual percentage of institutions with first year seminars uh, is 84%. Okay, not 87.1. So always keep that in mind that you have to go back and multiply against that question that said, do you have anything? Do you have anything like this at all? Okay, I want you to note that in every case, private institutions are somewhat more likely than public institutions to offer these courses. Um, that's true, and here's the private column is the second column. That's true in first year and throughout. It's not, it's not a huge difference, but you are still somewhat more likely to, uh, to offer courses at all levels. Now, I want to move to a slide that differentiates levels of student participation in these courses. And you can see uh, that our smaller institutions, that is up to 5,000 students, uh, enroll a larger percentage of students in each of these initiatives. So um, that is pretty striking. It's, it's well over the, the mean for uh, the whole uh, group uh, as we uh, looked at all of them. So again, I think uh, what this probably means is more small institutions require students to participate in initiatives at every level. They really don't offer uh, these initiatives as electives. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that, but again, I think that probably we're seeing a larger number of required uh, courses in smaller private institutions than, than in larger public institutions. 
Now, if you require your students to be a part of these kinds of activities that are embedded in the curriculum, you have a greater likelihood, of course, of giving them your stamp and helping them understand what is unique and special about your particular college or university. Now, I want to acknowledge that uh, we were sort of on a fishing expedition for information on sophomore and junior seminars and learning communities. We'll go to the learning community slide in a minute. So rather than asking respondents to check a list of possible characteristics, we asked them simply to offer some open-ended comments about sophomore and junior seminars. And I have selected some descriptions to, um, to show you. Um, and this is sort of just a brief sample of the, uh, the, the numbers of descriptions that, that we received. And again, many of those are referenced in the, in the booklet that I'll give you. And we have even more uh, back in our data set. And if any of you want to see the whole list, uh, we'd be happy to show you that whole list. But, but you can see here what's going on. Um, part of a four-year course sequence, that sort of uh, almost a, maybe a vertical general education plan, uh, that something unique is going on in every year of the undergraduate experience. Here's some of the themes, focus on self and society, purpose, as John mentioned, which is a, a, a strong um, goal for many sophomore level programs and critical thinking. Of course, first year programs are also addressing critical thinking, but we're doing it again in the sophomore year. Uh, a number of major based courses. Um, and then looking at special topics like information literacy in a particular major. Um, coverage of, again, specific general education competencies in one case. The sophomore year was when students really looked at multiculturalism as a particular topic. Um, that, that's a question for you. When do students need to be introduced to multiculturalism? We, we sort of argued for that in the first year, but that maybe there are more things you can do in the sophomore year. Some residential uh, experiences, sophomore residential colleges, sophomore seminars embedded in those. Um, here's a little bit of a different idea. Courses for students who are they're back, but they're not doing too well, so they're on probation. So almost another version of a first-year seminar, but again, geared at probationary students, students at risk of dropping out. Then some career-oriented courses, and finally, honors courses. We see honors courses. In fact, I'm really curious, how many of you uh, offer seminars at some point in your honors programs? OK, so you're doing something special for honors students throughout. And you'll, you'll see that represented as we look at these examples. Junior seminars, um, much of the same that we see um, in the sophomore seminars, except uh, I think more focus, again, on graduation more focus on the major, juniors abroad. I noticed as we read uh, some of the information that was sent to us about what you're currently doing, that I believe it's Arcadia. Is Arcadia here? Uh, doing a lot of work um, with study abroad. Uh, experiential learning requirements. Capstone for the general education course. So this isn't the real senior capstone, but you know we're sort of saying we're finishing gen ed here in the junior year. And uh, you can read um, the other couple of items here. But again, these, this is just a brief summary of some of the examples of what's going on in junior seminars. Now, when we got to senior seminars, we, we actually knew a fair amount about senior seminars. The National Resource Center uh, at the University of South Carolina has, has conducted, um, I, I believe, two separate surveys of senior seminars. and so. Here we felt like we had sort of an idea of what was going on. So we did create this predetermined list of topics that were drawn from these previous surveys. And so here you can see the percentage of institutions that indicate that the senior seminar is, is doing uh, these particular things. We've known for a long time that often the senior seminar really belongs to the department that it's more major focused than it is focused on general education. And you see that represented here. Um, some of these, though, are doing career readiness. And again, when you get down to integration of general education in the major or better understanding of the liberal arts, before you leave here, we want you to really understand 
about the liberal arts. Uh, it's you know, under 50%, but there are still uh, some institutions that are doing those things. And then finally, there were some outliers, and I just picked a couple uh, for, from one of our uh, faith-based colleges, Integration of Faith and Learning, or preparation for a senior project so that the senior seminar was really organized around the creation of, of a senior project. Okay, so that's uh, the seminar. And we then ask a number of questions about learning communities. Now, I want to make sure that we are using uh, a common definition of learning communities because I've been uh, hearing it used in a number of different ways. But the definition that we gave in the survey is that a learning community is a, um, a grouping of at least two courses across the curriculum. Can be more than two. But so that the same small cohort group of students, somewhere around 25 or perhaps fewer, are co-enrolled in two or more courses. So that's how we were using the term learning community in this particular survey. Now I know some of you use it to really define what I guess I would call a first year seminar. But I wanted to draw that distinction. Now again, we started with this basic question, do you do this anywhere in the curriculum? And um, slightly over half of our respondents said, yes, we do it somewhere. And then again, the majority of respondents said, we do this in the first year. Again, when we multiply this out, the 90.6% of 56.5% is 51.2%. So just over half of our institutional sample indicates that um, they are offering learning communities. Now, as you see here, the, the data sort of flip in that the larger colleges and universities are far more likely to offer learning communities than those that are the very smallest, and that would be 1,000 or under. Uh, actually, there's pretty good representation across the other size levels uh, of colleges. Now, you see um, transfer, these figures really, really drop down a few more at the sophomore level, but virtually non-existent at the junior and the senior level. Now, there's good news here. This is a great in innovation. It's, uh, there are some real powerful learning outcomes, good retention outcomes, but there is kind of a warning for you here, and that is that these largest colleges and universities are trying to look more like you. They're trying to carve themselves up into smaller functional units. So students feel like they're at a small campus, but they still have some of the advantages of the really big place, like big football teams and, and whatever advantages you might find at a really, really large institution. But they are, in some way, offering you some competition here for your particular environment. Now, I have a lot of questions about learning communities. I'm going to try to not go off on a tangent. But in many ways, the type of learning that learning communities foster, that is the interface between fields of knowledge and the need for different perspectives on a central problem, is equally, if not more, suited to the sophomore, junior, and senior year than it is to the first year. And yet, because learning community participation has been correlated with retention, uh, these programs have been overwhelmingly and sometimes exclusively a first-year initiative. Now, I know there are other reasons that it's tough to offer learning communities when you get beyond the first year, because you're into the major, and it's hard to do those course connections. And yet, when I look at learning goals for learning communities, and by the way, I would argue that if you don't have learning goals for learning communities, you probably don't need to do them, because they're, they're not easy. And I, Richard is sitting over here, and he's, he's the exemplar uh, for a wonderful learning communities program that, as I recall, you are now expanding to subsequent years. Is that right, Richard? I see. OK, a three-course sequence. So um, again, just something for you to think about. I know it's not easy, but I hope that if the learning community is not the way that you give students this interdisciplinary perspective and this ability to learn at least a little bit about a range of fields, that you'll think about, well, how else might we do this? Because I think that's a, a really important 
skill, it's, it's more than a skill. It's a learning objective for a democracy. But that's what we're hoping to uh, produce, is citizens who know enough about enough topics to make an educated decision, and not just rely on the experts, whoever the experts are or think they are. I wanted to give you um, a sense of some of the characteristics of learning communities. Most of these won't surprise you. Um, here, here are the majority. We did have a, an item on the survey. We said students are co-enrolled, but faculty do not work closely together. And we had a significant percentage of folks who said, yeah, that's our situation, that students are co-enrolled, but faculty pretty much never talk to each other. And, and that's too bad. Again, when I give you the full survey report, you'll see those data. Of course, lots of, of linkage to residence life, um, slightly over half. Common intellectual theme, rather than just being this hodgepodge of courses that have no uh, guiding theme. Uh, I wanted you to note that when we got to sophomore learning communities, the, the number really drops. We're down to 44 campuses. Uh, but you can see there the, the kinds of uh, characteristics that, that emerged as, as the top characteristics. And then there were a few others that are fewer than 12%. Also, junior and senior learning communities, there were only 13 of these identified in our whole uh, survey sample. But you can see there again, um, I don't know what the green, I don't know where the green belt learning community is. I don't know if that's any of you, but uh, a, a themed, a sustainability themed learning community in the senior year. Again, something that reflects faith based education. Uh, but these are just some of the few examples of learning communities at uh, the upper levels. Let me move along now to another uh, idea, and uh, this is a common intervention that I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are using in some way, and that is early warning. And that is following students in, in some fashion through the undergraduate years to track their progress. And as you can see again, uh, institutions with fewer than 5,000 students are more likely to follow students at the upper levels. Now, I didn't show you the first year slide again. That's in the book that you have. Um, but a lot of you uh, that are um, under 5,000 students, are, you're, really, you're not letting those students go. Um, you're tracking them uh, through uh, the senior year, which is pretty amazing. Now, students most likely to be monitored, that's no surprise. Students on academic probation, athletes, EOP students, scholarship students. But again, when I look at the numbers of you who are saying, we're following everybody, not just those special categories of students. Uh, and of course, there, there are lots of other questions that we investigated about early warning, like, well, OK, so you've got early warning. What do you do? Uh, how do you follow up? Who's involved in that? Um, and so you'll get a lot of data on that particular inter intervention. Uh, another area that we looked at was service learning. And I noticed, uh, again, in reviewing many of the documents that you sent us, that many of you have civic engagement as one of your, your primary emphases at your college or university. And again, you can see here pretty even representation of service learning programs across the various uh, size levels. I'm always interested in this don't know line. <laughs> that. And especially when we get up to 20,000 students or over, there are a fair number of folks who really, they don't know what we're doing uh, in service learning. So, um, but you know, it, that's far less likely to happen the smaller you are. And again, percentage of student participation, it's, it's not huge, all right? It could be better. We could certainly scale this up. Um, but it, it is uh, not that inconsistent here. Private institutions, though, once again, lead the way. And um, I'm sure, and I don't have my statistician here, that some of these differences are statistically significant. Probably others are not. The last area that I want to show you is undergraduate research. And I know that many of you are interested in undergraduate research. Now, while the majority of institutions at all size levels offer undergraduate research, the highest level of student participation and I'm sure this is no surprise, it's in the senior year. Uh, it's still, it's not huge, because obviously this is a program that can, there, there are some limits to the number of faculty who could actually engage one-to-one -one with students or in a group with students. 
But again, this is something that we know that uh, is a very, very powerful educational uh, intervention for many students, and especially students of uh, minority backgrounds and women. Uh, show some really, really strong levels of uh, learning and retention if they are involved in undergraduate research opportunities. Okay, so what can we glean from the survey findings? Uh, it's easy to see that still the greatest emphasis for these programs continues in the first year, and in some cases the senior year. Uh, the bookends, as John said, are the, the slices of bread of the undergraduate sandwich. And although there are many good reasons to focus on the first year, uh, the one that continues to hold the day is improving student retention. And I really regret that retention is the primary motivator for activities that should be mostly about learning, but such is the world in which we live. Now, and size matters, too, in a couple of different ways. Smaller institutions far more likely to involve more students in whatever it is they're doing. Larger institutions trying to look like smaller institutions, and especially through learning communities. To sum up, I think, um, and I'm sure you think, that each year of the undergraduate experience offers opportunities to, and I'm going to use a word out of psychology, so don't cringe, imprint students with your values and your institutional identity. And yes, to achieve market distinctiveness. Let's don't forget that particular goal as well. And it begins in the first year, but the first year isn't enough. Each of your institutions has a unique identity that hopefully you share not only with your faculty and staff, but also with your students. So questions for you, who manages that identity? Who ignores that identity? And the big question for you, how can you use each stage of the undergraduate experience to give students a more transforming experience with you in accordance with how you see your special mission and function and role in today's world? And with that question, we're going to uh, ask you if you have any questions of either John. John, you still down there? Okay, <laughs> I can't We're see you. Yes. If you have any immediate questions for us, and if not, we'll send you uh, over to the other location. But, but before we leave, any questions or comments from the audience? Yes, sir. We've been uh, trying to think about entering and exiting experiences rather than first and fourth year trying to you know, get ourselves off of the freshman only. You know, given the number of transfer students we have, and also in our case, non traditional degree completions for undergraduates. Right? So you have students coming in who are coming in for the last year and a half or two years, or they're coming in only for the, the, the last two years to just complete a degree. And we're trying to figure out what kinds of experiences can do this kind of imprinting as I'm lying through using. But you know, how do you do that with students who, are, who clearly have already decided they're going to be moving about? They're already kind of swirling about. Uh, and they're clearly coming in you for kind of instrumental reasons. They want to complete the degree or finish up. They're not that same population. So how do you achieve those first year seminar kind of objectives with that population? What works and what doesn't? Right. Well, I think the fact that you're concerned about it and that you're thinking about it is, is really good. I think there are an awful lot of institutions that really don't think about, well, what is it that we want these students to get from this experience? And how will they also be different as a result of having been here? Um, and I think anything that you can do intentionally uh, to introduce students whenever they come in to your particular character, that may be a seminar. Again, we saw a fair number of transfer type seminars, or, but there may be other kinds of experiences that you can also offer students to really bring them into the fold, okay? But you're absolutely right. You have to focus on that. John? Uh, I, I would say that uh, a place to start would be uh, collecting the institutional knowledge and data on what's happening to your transfer students. Where are they coming from? Why are they coming to you? Um, how um, successful are they vis-a-vis -vis, you know, those particular um, origins? Uh, then concluding from that, something about what's the culture of your institution for transfer students? 
uh, asking a question, the question, who owns these people? Who are their advocates? And one of our biggest findings is that the approach to transfers, unlike first-year students, is highly decentralized. There's a lack of consistency about how the institution deals with them. And generally, it's the enrollment management folks who own them. Once they've handed them off, they don't have the same level of advocacy at the highest levels of the institution. So what matters most for these students, unlike first-year students, is the real experience of the transfer student is in the major, all right? And you've got to work to develop a culture of ownership at the major level. So then uh, to do that, two things. Um, you've got to bite the bullet and make transfer orientation mandatory. Uh, many of them, when it's optional, they will not participate because they think they've already been successful somewhere. They don't need this. Raw, they do need it. And you need to get a number of stakeholders involved in that orientation, including, and I would say perhaps especially, the faculty in the major and the people in the library and other key academic support services. Uh, the underutilization of librarians is just stunning. And that's something that I'm trying to do something about. So uh, orientation, uh, assigning to these students some kind of mentor from the major, a student mentor a fac and or a faculty mentor. Um, this is another opportunity for partnerships with your student affairs colleagues, creating certain kinds of uh, student activity organizations focused on, uh, on transfer students. Um, another thing that's very important is to gather them for assessment, uh, offer them some focus groups. You know, transfer students like to think that somebody gives a damn about them. And a way to do that is to gather them and ask them about their experiences and disseminate uh, your findings. Uh, one of the things that's really stunning to us now, and Betsy, your data revealed this, is that many of your colleges are offering transfer students better deals than they can get in the public sector, okay? Uh, the, the public sector is incredibly blasé about transfer students. Uh, they've got more of them, they know what to do with them. They're very prejudiced against them, particularly the prejudice against community college students is just stunning. And I, I think it's an invidious form of discrimination. Uh, many of these, those students are extraordinarily motivated, and they have overcome all kinds of obstacles. On the other hand, many of them are just like your first year students. They're middle class students for whom the community colleges have become the first college of choice because they think they're smart consumers, and they're going to trade up and get your degree. All right? So I, I, I think there's a, a lot to be hopeful there about that. And Betsy, when Betsy first shared with me, she and a colleague of ours doing this analysis, I felt really hopeful for the private colleges. I mean, this, this makes you guys look good. You're more likely to be doing the things that have shown student success than the public sector. I think that's a very important story, and you should not be reluctant to tell it, okay? Um, I didn't tell you earlier, another reason that makes me op uh, optimistic about your sector is when you look at the first year, we're finding in the colleges that uh, go through a, a planning process, and then we measure them four to five years out, see what they've done, look at the IPEDS retention data uh, that the federal government has. We're finding that for the small colleges, the private colleges that implement their plans, they have the highest levels of retention of any of the institutions we work with. They're effecting the most significant degrees of institutional change. So it's important for you to have the, first of you have the knowledge about what is it that students need, okay? What is it your students need? Not the students you used to have, or the students you wish you had, the students you actually have, okay? And what you do with that knowledge, and you create a plan, and then you execute that plan, okay? But the vision is very important, and that's why we, we think you need a vision for the, you know, the whole undergraduate experience, and a vision that's aspirational. It's not focused on minimum standards. It's not just about retaining them. It's about the kinds of, well, we tried to spell some of them out in our standards, but it's about your mission. How intentional are you about your mission? That is holy, sacred writ. It needs to be connected to everything you're doing. I sound like an accreditor, don't I? I don't mean, that's probably not a good association. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, thank you for your presentations, both. Uh, the question, Clearly it comes through that size does matter, smaller being better, public versus private leans towards the private. Did you find any difference in structure, centralized versus decentralized uh, organizations? So in this group we have some who have individual schools, uh, professional schools, have a strong core liberal arts, and others that function more as a liberal arts college. So 
How have you, did you find any difference in the data? We actually there any? did not ask those questions. I mean, I think that's that's a very good question. Again, I think there'd probably be some correlation with size that larger institutions tend to be more uh, have some sort of intake unit for first year students, a university college or a general college, um, than the smaller institutions. But that that's just kind of an assumption. Uh, so, but we didn't do the research, but that's a very good question. What we do know about that, though, is that you've got to have a common ethos, even if you've decentralized yourselves into collegiate organizations around faculty discipline. That if you've made the shift from the primary loyalty being from the institution to the, the collegiate discipline unit, you're going to have a greater challenge in uh, executing some of these broader aspirational uh, visions. Right, uh, and the, determining the, what should be common for every student. I mean, that's, that's correct. You know, we have dealt with institutions that say there's, there's nothing common, nor should there be. Okay, well, that, that, you know, that's a stance, and you and may it, agree or disagree. The, but. The, the research on the impact of college, though, suggests that what students remember, what they speak to, what connected them, are their common experiences. And those often are the experiences you didn't intentionally design for them, okay? But they had them. They had them in the bars in your town, okay? Uh, instead of, you know, you somehow making the, the community work for you. Um, you, sir, you're a wonderful example. You're, you're in a, um, you're what America is increasingly coming to look like, right? You're in an urban area, high unemployment, uh, tremendous social needs. Um, you're converting that into a laboratory for learning. And uh, that, that you, you have to use that environment. Otherwise, you have to use it intentionally. That's why the students will use it in ways that you might wish might they not hadn't. Um, well, folks, um, it is time for us to allow you to go over to the Eccles Center. And I wanted to let you know that John and I uh, put together a few questions uh, for each of your groups, each of your table groups, to discuss. Um, if you don't like our questions, develop your own questions. But we really do want you to talk In together. true liberal arts fashion. Yeah, right? true yeah. liberal arts fashion, right. <laughs> to talk together about what we've said and how you relate to it and where you see your interest. Now we're going to reconvene you and get some sense of the conversations right. and reporting out. The, the most important thing we want to ask you is, what are you going to do with what you've talked Whatever about? You how do you translate that into some action back home? But this we will not, stay is, in the other location for that big reconvening. Okay? Thank you.